How many of you would rather be here than in jail? <laughs> Amen? A lot of worse places you could be, right? I was talking to Brother this morning. I said, you know, when you read the news and you hear what's going on around the world, you have to thank the Lord you're in Taiwan, right? I mean, we have, uh, you know, we have typhoons, we have earthquakes, we have all the stuff you need so that you'll never be bored. But uh, some of the things going around the world, we don't have anybody trying to bomb our building today that I know of. Now, if you're here and you're going to bomb the building, if you'll wait till the sermon's over, and when they sing the last song, bomb it then, because I'm going to leave. <laughs> okay, I've got to go to Shinju, but uh, it's good to see you, and I'm, I appreciate you taking the time to come out and to be here. Uh, many people are traveling, and uh, I know that the church is in transition between pastors, and the new pastor is going to be coming, uh, I think, in August. Is that right? August, right? And uh, so uh, you pray for that. Pray for Brother Homer. Uh, he's in the States now, of course, visiting his children. And uh, he, he says he's going to retire. This is the second time in his life I've heard him say that. And so, uh, you know, as a minister, you never really retire. I'm almost sure if you really want to test and see if he really retired, send him an email and invite him to speak. You watch what he does, okay? He'll be on the next flight, <laughs> okay? All right. If you have your Bibles, if you will, turn to Psalms 105. And while you're turning there, they'll turn the PowerPoint on. And we've been studying in the life of Joseph, and uh, uh, let's back up to the verse just in front of that slide, if you will. All right. As we said, Joseph, in most places where you might study the Bible, would be called a type of Christ. But he's also a very, even more pure type of a Christian, all right? Joseph is a sinner, and we'll find in the messages in the next few weeks some of the sins he committed, all right? Even the one passed down by his own great-grandfather, and uh, so we'll see that he's a sinner. And so he's a better type of a Christian, a type of your life. Your life will match his life in many ways. And it's interesting that the Lord put in the Word of God, right in the very first book in the Bible, he put eight men's names that you need to get to know because something in their life will match your life beyond the year 2000 and what you have uh, and what you live through now. And so God put it in the very beginning of the Bible, starting with, Adam, and he ends the book of Genesis with a man named Joseph. Joseph's life covers the last of the last 13 chapters in Genesis. Twelve of them are about Joseph, and one is about his brother Judah, where God gives you a comparison in chapter 38 and 39 as to why God picked Joseph above Judah at that time. Judah, in chapter 38, if you read it, it's good private reading, was a man of the flesh, all right? And Joseph he was a man of the Spirit, and so God put that comparison there and then finished the story. Now, Job is also another book in the Bible that I encourage you to read, and when you think about the life of Joseph, if you read the book of Job during that time, you'll see a lot of things that are exactly the same. And Job said, Job 23.10, But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. And that's a verse that could surely picture the life of Joseph. Now, the message this week then, next slide, I've called the cross of the dream. In Psalm 105, verse 16 to 23, uh, if you have your Bible, uh, and I should do that too, shouldn't I? In Psalm 105, King, uh, in the Psalms, uh, it mentions Joseph again, and this passage is about what God did in the Old Testament and about what he did in the uh, days of Abraham. And it says in Psalm 105, verse 16, Moreover, he called for a famine upon the land. He broke the whole staff of bread. He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron until the time that his word came. The word of the Lord tried him. The king sent and loosed him even the ruler of the people, and let him go. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his substance to bind his princes at his pleasure and teach his senators wisdom. Israel also came in Egypt, and Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham, and he increased his people greatly and made them stronger than their enemies. 
He turned their heart to hate his people, to deal subtly with his servants, and then he sent Moses, his servant, and Aaron, whom he had chosen. And so the Bible has a great deal to say about Joseph and about his life, but in this passage it particularly mentions his imprisonment. And we went in last week, of course, how that uh, the Lord had taken Joseph from a pit and uh, he put him for 12 years in Potiphar's house. And uh, if you go to the next slide, it's kind of a review of everything that happened there. So he was touched by the Lord in chapter 37. We see the Lord come to him, and he has a dream about the Lord and uh, how the Lord began to deal with his heart and tell him what was going to happen. And the dream, you remember the difference between a dream and an illusion is this. A dream will always show you the end. A dream comes from the Lord, and it's prophetic. An illusion is something the devil gives you, all right, that usually is immediate. And so illusions are the things that we are deceived by in the immediate need of the hour. But a dream, something from the Lord, is known in the Bible as the favor of God. You'll not find anything in your life better than finding the will of God for your life and knowing the favor of God. Joseph's contact with God was rejected by his family. One of the problems in the call of God in your life then, when you get to know the Lord better, is the first people who usually reject it are the ones you love the most. And that's because they know you the most. And I, I still remember when I uh, came home and told them, you know, I told my parents uh, and my teacher and everybody, uh, well, uh, God's called me to be a missionary. And they all just smiled. And my grandfather, I told him, and he goes, we'll see. <laughs> you know, that's the way it is, right? He's rejected by his family. Then he's betrayed by his brothers. They plot against him. They sell him. He was made a slave where he learned a new language and a culture for 10 years. One of the side effects of Joseph going to Potiphar's house was he learned the Egyptian language, all right? And he also learned to manage and did some things there. So God sometimes, in a time of your life where you're not sure why you're there or what you're there for, God many times will put things in your life on a daily basis that you need later, and that's called preparation. But then he comes to the type where he has to make a choice, and he, we know from seeing it that Potiphar's wife plots against him. First, she casts her eyes on him, all right? And so the Bible says that she wanted him. She made him an offer, all right, for the physical pleasure of life. And then because he refused and because he named the name of his God and called it a sin, then he was set up. The Bible says to you, he came and there was no man in the house, a very odd thing in the land of Egypt with a man like that. There would always be servants around. And so she sets him up and then lies about him in an act of vengeance, all right? And the Lord allows it to happen. So Joseph is cast into prison. And we closed the message last week tell you about the song and the things that sometimes you find written on prison walls. The love of God, that song written on a prison wall, an insane asylum prison, okay, by an unknown man. But he wrote that. And what it tells you is that the man, he probably wasn't as insane as they thought he was. He knew the Lord. And when you know the Lord, you are in your right mind. Now the next slide then will take us into the message today. And that is the, the prison part of his life. Now, what happens in chapter 39, verse 19, is Potiphar comes home, and you read those verses that said, and when he hears his wife and all the things that she accuses him of, he's angry, and he's mad at Joseph. And he gives no, he doesn't let any witnesses come to testify in Joseph's behalf. He just administers the punishment and condemns Joseph. Depends on which history you read, but probably it's very true that the Egyptian master would not just say, bring the police over and take him to jail. He would beat him himself for what he'd done. And so Joseph likely was beaten on his back just like the Lord Jesus Christ was by Pilate. And then set off. And the Bible tells you in Psalms 105 that they bound his hands, that they bound his feet, and they led him away, and they hurt him. They hurt him on his way to prison, all right? And what this brings us to is a point in the life of Jesus Christ and a point in your life that's very real, that if you haven't experienced it yet, you will. And if you have experienced, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about, and that's this. At some point in your life as a child of God, there comes what we call a cross. And the cross is where what you want and what you deem as the normal things in life comes at odds with what God wants. 
And a cross is made where man's will is here and God's will comes down right through it, all right? It makes a cross. We call it a crossroad. Why? Because there's two avenues to it. And so the cross comes in the life, and the cross, I want you to learn to think about it today in this regard. A cross in your life is a door to a period of time in your life that the Bible lays out many times and calls a prison. The cross in the life of Jesus Christ is what you look at a lot of times, all right? And you look at the cross and Jesus on the cross and we say he's nailed up there and he's dying for our sins and that cross is just a small event in the crucifixion of Christ. Because what happens after that is three days. And we'll see even in this story how that during those three days is where the agony of Jesus Christ is really found and what he did, all right? So the cross comes. And the cross then is the door to the prison. And therefore today I just, because Joseph is in prison, and I want to just give you uh, 582 things, no. <laughs> you know, my father, let me just share this with you. My father was a, a farmer and a pastor. And uh, he used to scare congregations because he only went to third grade. And so he would have to write out every, point, every line of his sermon he wrote out and he read them, okay? And he would label every point of the sermon as one of the points. So I still remember when visitors would come and he would get up and say, now today I want to give you 62 reasons. And people would sigh. <laughs> you know? Oh my goodness, <laughs> 62 reasons. But he was done in 30 minutes, okay, because he just read them, okay. And uh, I'm not going to be, well, I hope I'm not. If I am, okay, the, 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 maybe... We better start singing, I can only imagine sooner, okay, <laughs> all right? But I want to point you to some things that you probably know, but about the prison in your life. Now, if you've never been through this time of your life, if you're young, like you folks here, all right? You boys and girls, you remember what I tell you today, okay? Because in your life, after you trust Christ, when you trust Christ, these things will come to you as you try to find the will of God and you follow the Lord. And if you're in the middle of it, or if you're just about at the time of a cross in your life, these things will help you remember what the lessons of the prison were in Joseph's life. Now, the first thing, number one, is this. A prison is painful. Psalm 105, we just read, it says, They put his hands, they bound his hands and his feet, they hurt him with fetters of iron, and the word of the Lord tried him. And so Joseph goes to prison, and he's given pain. There's a great a truth in Scripture that God uses physical pain sometimes in our lives to purge us, all right? What does pain do? Well, there's many things, but I only pulled two out. One, pain always eliminates distractions. It's very hard to be interrupted when you have pain. Did you know that? It's very hard for someone else to call you or interrupt you when you're in great pain. You can only think of the pain. And so God, in a prison time of your life, when things have gone from bad to the bottom of your life, where it seems like it's the bottom, it's all down, it's all downhill, and you've hit the rock bottom, sometimes it's filled with pain, but that is to eliminate the distractions of life. God has taken Joseph now from the external things, the freedom of the servanthood he had, and all of these outward things, and now he's put him in a place where he's all by himself. And the pain in that moment then keeps him from being distracted. Number two, it focuses the mind. When you're in pain, you think of one thing. If you wake up tomorrow morning with a toothache, you know what you won't be thinking about? You won't be thinking about the praise and worship songs you just sang. You won't be thinking about, well, I uh, wonder what Pastor Freeman is going to preach next Sunday if the Lord tears. I wonder what I'm going to do. You, if you have a bad toothache when you wake up, you know what will happen? One, if anybody talks to you, you're going to tell them, not now, right? Don't interrupt me now. And number two, you have one thing on your mind, a dentist, or some way to get rid of that pain, and that's the Lord. And Paul says, pain is a teacher sent from God. Philippians 4.11, Paul the apostle said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am in, therewith to be content. That doesn't mean he's a, an American, okay? But that means in the state of being that he's in and the, and the realm of life that he's in. Paul said that in, in, Corinth, in 2 Corinthians 11, he said uh, he, he was in weariness and pain often. 
and in prisons often. And he said that that was part of his life that God put there to teach him. Number two, in a prison, you find this. Prison is agonizing. Now in chapter 40, verse 14 and 15, you find Joseph talking, and he's talking to the, in the prison, and he says to these men, when he, uh, later when he meets them, he says, but think on me when it shall be well with thee, and show kindness, I pray thee, and make mention of me unto favor, and bring me out. For indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I've done nothing that they should put me in this dungeon. So on Joseph's mind then is the agonizing thought of the things that have happened to him. When you go to prison, if you ever have a prison ministry, you can remember this. The first thing on the mind is first the loss of freedom. And Joseph, it says, his hands and his feet are bound. Just like the Lord Jesus Christ, they're nailed to the cross, right? The freedom is gone. You cannot move around like you used to. When God brings your life to the prison type of your life and the prison events of your life to make you into something better than you are, there'll be agonizing times. He lost his freedom. He was confined. He's not able to do. And in the prison of your life, sometime you'll feel the agony of being trapped. You'll be in a job and you'll think, how will I ever get out of this job? I've been working here at the McDonald's drive-thru for 40 years. Is it ever going to end? I've been working at 7-Eleven. I've been working my, my job. I remember I worked at a bologna factory and a hot dog factory. That's why I never ate it, okay? I knew what was in it, okay? And you know how it is in life. Sometime when you know what it's made of, you know what you're not going to touch, right? But uh, not, to, not to put a damper on those that you, well, never mind. If you eat a hot dog, pray before you eat it, okay? Say the blessing before you eat one of those things. But you feel like I'll never get out. You can be in a bad relationship in your marriage and feel like I'm trapped. You can feel bad in your school. I'm trapped. You can have all kinds of things, an addiction, and feel trapped, all right? The loss of freedom. And number two, the loss of his reputation. When you go to prison, your friends leave. They never think of you the same again. Joseph went to prison and not only lost his freedom, but all the people that had ever worked with him thought that he tried to rape Potiphar's wife. He was put there for something he didn't do. And in the prison in chapter 40, it says that was on his mind. He said, I'm here, but I didn't do anything to deserve to be here. And that's an agonizing thought, isn't it? Have you ever been in a place in your life where you want to explain the truth and they won't listen? Sometimes children try to explain to their parents and the parents are too angry to listen, right? Sometimes the parents uh, are talking to someone else and the, the spouse, the husband... And they won't listen, and it's an agonizing thing, right? It's the prison time of your life. And Job, as we said, uh, said the words, but he knoweth the way that I take, and when he hath tried me, I shall come forth his gold. He said those words, having sat down and listened to his three friends accuse him of secretly sinning and bringing this judgment of God on himself. They could not see God doing it to Job to make him better than he was and to purge him of something on the inside. And he said after hearing what they said about him, he knows the way I take. And when he's tried me, I'll come out as gold. That was what he clung to. But there's agony in the prison. And then number three, I want you to remember this. Prison is not only agonizing and prison is not only painful, but prison is always personal. Your Bible says in 39, 19, and 20 that when Potiphar came home, he looked at Joseph, and Joseph was the focus of his anger. And he took Joseph and cast him into the prison. Prison is personal in your life. A prison time, when God puts you through that time in your life where you're, the externals are gone and all the crowds are gone and all the friends are gone to bring you to something better than you've ever known. But when God does that, first of all, you yourself are the only one that has a knowledge of your past. Only Joseph could remember the dream that started this thing. Only Joseph could have the thought in his mind that Every time I've mentioned God, it hasn't gone well. Every time I brought God up to someone else, it hasn't gone that well. Joseph had the knowledge of that. Joseph knew what he wasn't guilty of. Your Bible says of Jesus Christ, they hated me without a cause. 
That's what the Lord said. They became my enemy and they wrongfully hated me without a cause. That's what he said. And in your life, sometimes people will hate you without a cause. Now, most of the time, the Lord will reveal to you that there is a cause, but they didn't know about it, right? <laughs> and so people coming to you this way, the knowledge of the past, and then here's a very important point you'll want to remember when you get to this point in your life. The feelings of the present are always personal. When you come to the prison part of your life, when God puts you through this part of your Christian life and your training and purging you and making you something more than you ever thought you could be, when God's going to do that in your life, what He does is He brings you to this personal part where in the prison of your life, you will no longer say, why did that happen? You will say, why did that happen to me? You will no longer look at a news event or something big and say, why does God let these kind of things happen? That won't be how you address it anymore. You will say, why does God let that happen to me? Because it's personal. And in Joseph's life, there in the prison, it was very personal. And think about it. He'd worked about 12 years for Potiphar. He had a system of life there. He had freedom there. But he had overcome the temptation to fall into thinking Potiphar was the most important. And his freedom that he produced was the worst. And he overcame the temptation to sin against God. And in all of that, he wound up in prison. And in the prison then, he's thinking about what's happened in the past. And he's looking back at all the events of his life. And he's feeling it. And my friend, listen to me. You will be the only one who knows how you really feel. Other people may be through the same thing as you, but they will never know how you feel exactly. Because that's a personal thing that God gives you. We look at kids sometime and they cry and we say, well, you'll get over it, you'll get over it. But listen to me, the pain of your first love walking away and a broken heart it's very real, and it's different in every person. It's not the same in any two people. When you come back from a war zone, one soldier can talk about, boy, we sure did this, and, he's a, and another man won't talk about it at all. One comes back from war, and he moves on with life and goes on with life, and the next one suffers from PTSD all his life. He can't get over the nightmares. That's because prison is personal and it's personal to you and God puts that there Jesus Christ when he died on the cross he went for three days somewhere and the Bible says it became very personal personal things are hidden in your heart to make you something that you cannot be otherwise God puts something inside you that he doesn't put in anybody else that's the reason God never named his children by numbers he gave them names from the very beginning. God didn't come to Adam and say, you're Lao Da. And Eve, you're Lao Gung Da. <laughs> okay? He didn't say that. Uh, uh, I mean, I got to say that in English, don't I? How do you do that? <laughs> okay? Brother, it's your turn. What, how do you say that? You're number one, right? And Eve, you're above number one. Okay? You're the boss of number one. Okay? But God didn't do that. He gave him a name. Now, the devil in the Bible gives you a number. You ever notice that? Kind of shows you that maybe he can't remember everybody's name, okay? Or he's not that interested. You're just a number to him. But you see, the Bible says of the Lord, he's, we have a high priest, Hebrews 4:15, 4, 4, that can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. You don't have a high priest that's just out there doing the celebration and just out there doing the sequence and just out there doing this and doing that. That's not what he is. He can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. How come? Well, because in your Bible it says when the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross, he was the Lamb of God, right? And as we'll see later, the Lamb of God. You know what they did to the Lamb when they offered it? They bring it on the Day of Atonement. They killed the Lamb at the gate. The people were there watching. The high priest was there. 
They shed the blood of the lamb. They took the blood of the lamb and gave it to the high priest. And then they closed the veil. And the priest took the blood before the Lord. But what did he do with the lamb? He put the lamb on a fire. And the lamb continued to cook and a burnt sacrifice was there, right? He went there. Why was that lamb on the fire? Because that sacrifice was also part of what God demanded. God just did, did demand the blood to forgive your sins and atone for it. He demanded that the lamb suffer the judgment for your sin. What's God's judgment on sin? The lake of fire. So Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, you see him up there. And he says, it's finished. I've given my blood. I've given my blood now for all men. That's finished. And now I got to go somewhere. And the Bible says in Acts 2, 33, uh, 31, and Psalm 16, it says this. The Lord said, he wouldn't leave his soul in hell. Speaking of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, what went on there? Well, you see, the prison time that the Lord went to was also very personal. And that's why in the Bible you can read and there's all kind of small things there. But there's a part of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that only He knows. And you can sing about it and you can read about it and think about it, but you'll never know. Which is why in the end of the Bible it says He comes forth and there's a name written on Him that nobody knows. Why? Because he was the burnt sacrifice of God for your sins. The feelings that come. Paul said, in my body I bear the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then number four, the prison is not just a bad part in your life. It's also got a test. And we say the prison is revealing. 40 verse 1 to 4, it tells you that two prisoners were put down in there with Joseph. And it says in verse 4, and he served them. Now what that does is it reveals something that's in Joseph's heart that you didn't think could be there in these conditions. Because in Joseph's life, it's usually been when he was at Potiphar that he looked his best because he had everything that he needed, right? But now what God is showing Joseph is that my work in your heart is bigger than your circumstances. So the, he the prison is a revealing time. First, the need. Joseph responded to the need. Prison is a selfish place. If you've ever done a prison ministry, you know, uh, you go through there and talk to those guys and those ladies and stuff, and everybody in prison shouldn't be there. They all have a reason they shouldn't be there. They all have a reason it's unfair to be there. And they're all about themselves. In the prison part of your life, the people you rub elbows with, you're going to find are very selfish, okay? It's very hard to be something different, but in the most selfish place on earth, it says, and Joseph served them. That's what he was there for, like the Lord. The Lord went to the prison of his life, and the Bible says in 1 Peter, he went and preached to the spirits in prison. All right? He served there. And then the future, 41 verse 9, it says the future is revealed. Joseph says to these men the dream that's going to come to pass. And look at the timing of this. He says in three days. So God put him in a place where he had just a three-day window to get in there and talk to these guys, right? And he tells them what will happen. And it happens. But it takes two years before he's thought of again. In 41 verse 9, the butler's there. Pharaoh dreams a dream. And what does that butler say? I remember my fault. I remember my fault. I was supposed to talk to you about this kid in prison. And I forgot, okay? Prisons are revealing, right? It's revealing. It revealed how deep this man appreciated what Joseph had done for him. Not much. In the ministry of the Lord, as you serve the Lord, you're going to find sometimes that the people that you help the most remember you the least. Sometimes when you give your whole life to someone and you help them and uh, you, you don't get anything back, right?
Now, sometimes it's not on purpose. Sometimes it's just because they're young and stupid, right? <laughs> I've always told people the story. I went back, uh, we'd been in Taiwan, we'd been in Taiwan eight, eight or nine years, I think it was, and we went back for a furlough. Well, when I got married in the States, you know, we lived there for a while, and I served, and then I had a job and stuff, so it was a while before we got here. And I remember I went to my mother-in-law's church, and uh, if you're just married, that's a very important thing to do, <laughs> okay, all right? When your mother-in-law says, we're going to go to this church, I don't care what you believe, you go to that church, okay? <laughs> that's a good thing. But anyway, I get in there, and I was just standing there, you know, and, and a lady came up to me, and she goes... I know you. You're Danny Freeman. Well, nobody calls me Danny unless it's a grandmother about to, you know, take you to the woodshed or something. You'll see you get nervous when you hear Danny. That my, you know, your mother enunciates when you're in trouble, you know. You know, when you hear Daniel Lee Freeman, you know that's not a good thing, okay? And when someone calls you Danny, well, that's not a good thing either. So here she comes, and I said, uh, yes, yes, I, I do. I know she goes, I went to your wedding, and I never got a thank you card. <laughs> she remembered, <laughs> okay, and I said this same verse. I remember my fault. I couldn't remember who she was, you know. <laughs> when a young man's getting married, he, listen, the farthest thing from his mind is a thank you card, all right? But you see, God in a prison sends people your way. In the lowest ebb of your life, when you think your life is on the bottom and you ought to be thinking about only yourself, God will send someone there as a test and an opportunity to reveal something from your heart. You know what he did to Apostle Paul? Paul and them were in jail in Acts 16, 28. You know what the Lord did? He sent an earthquake. Remember that? And then what happened? He sent the jailer into them. We have a whole book in the Bible written in the town about the town, about the joy of the Lord and everything from that episode in Acts 16, the Lord sent it. Then the last thing about a prison you want to remember is this. Number five, prison is temporary, especially with the Lord. Over and over your Bible says in the prophecies in Isaiah and other places, here's what it says. It says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. You see that? That's a prophecy about the Lord coming and how quick it can change. Now you may be in the bottom of your life right now. You may be in a place where you think that it's, you can't get any worse than this, and this is how your life's going to end, and I've got good news for you today. Prison times in your life are temporary. God will pull you out because your destiny is not the prison. Your destiny is the palace. Your destiny is the blessings of God upon your life, and he may put you through all these things to get you ready to go there. But that prison you're in right now is temporary. It's not going to hold you forever. And one of these days, either on this earth or in glory, you're going to be freed from all those things that bind you right now that you think you can't escape from. Eternity begins suddenly in the Bible. It says, Our light of fiction, which is but for a moment, worketh with uh, far more seeding eternal weight of glory. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 52, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we'll all be changed. The Lord will change it just like that. My, what a difference a day makes in your life, doesn't it? Alexander Solzhenitsyn, he was a prisoner in Russia. And I remember reading uh, his book, and I went to hear him speak one time, and uh, I remember hearing him talk about it. He said, you know, he said, I was in prison, and I went outside, as always, and I'd had sickness and dysentery from how they feed you and treat you. And he said, I sat there. And I knew if I ran for those fences there that they would kill me because they'd done it to many before. And so sitting there in the dirt, I said to myself, I said, God, forgive me. But I cannot take this another day. I am going to go. And he said, just as I reached down on the ground to push myself up and run, an older prisoner who'd been there longer than I stepped right in front of me. 
And this is the first time I've got the stick to do the illustration with. He said, <laughs> he took a stick that he had, and down in front of me in the ground, in the sand, he drew a cross. He said, I looked at that cross, and the thought in my mind was, finish what God has asked you to bear. So he said, I let go of the sand, and I stayed. But he said, the part about, part about it that was amazing to me was this. In less than 24 hours from that moment, I was walking across a bridge in Geneva free with my wife and children waiting on the other side. I came to the point where I thought I'll never get out and I almost gave up and the Lord brought me through. Now if you're there today, if you're in that spot in your life where you say, I can't take this anymore, I want you to remember that. Because that Bible says that there was a day Joseph had no idea what was happening and Pharaoh, it says, he called for Joseph hastily. Open that door. And one of these days in your life, maybe here, maybe in eternity, but he will. The Lord is going to open that door. Think of this verse when you think of that. The next slide. The Bible says that I may know him and the power of resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. We like to walk with God. We like to sing the praise of the Lord. We like to see the blessings of God. Most of us would have loved to be there in the feeding of the 5,000. We'd love to be in all those parts, right? But very few people, very few people would like to sit at the foot of the cross and be identified as being a friend of the thief on the cross that they saw in Jesus. And I don't know of any Christians that would want to go down and be placed on the altar of the Lord. We do not know the mystery of it. We just know the Bible says he wouldn't leave his soul in hell. And all of the things that happened down there and the way that it transpired, I don't know. But by, when you know the Lord, you know the fellowship of his sufferings. Now here's the question as we close. So why was it that Joseph had to go to prison? Why do you have in your life as a child of God a time that's like a prison where God eliminates the external to do something different with you? Next verse. In the life of Jesus Christ, here's why he did it. Because you see, one of these days, the Bible says he's going to come back. And he's going to come to his people he came the first time, the children of Israel in Bethlehem, and he wanted to save them, right? And they pushed him away. But with God, there's always a second chance. And he's coming back. You know what the Bible says? It says he's going to come, and they're going to think, this is our Messiah, he's come back. And then they're going to notice, one shall say unto him, what are these wounds in thine hands? And he's going to answer, I was wounded in the house of my friends. And the identifying marks of the Lord Jesus Christ will be the testimony to the nation of Israel that you crucified me the first time I came. And I've come back. And they will mourn, it says. So the first reason Joseph goes to prison is to get the marks of identity on him. You know why you have to go through a time in your life like that? Because God's going to mark you, and God will scar you, and God will put something in your life when you really want to do the will of God and really want to know the Lord well. When you really seek the Lord like that and you follow him all the way through, God will do something and put a scar and a mark on you that you will always be reminded of how you got it. And you'll always be reminded of the prayers you prayed and what you went through to get that. It's a personal thing. Finally, here's the real reason, though. 
The Bible says he, he went to prison, you know, and, you know, prison is where we see about ourselves and about our needs and about our God and about our identity. But I think the real reason, the simple reason on the surface, of course, of the Bible itself and in your life is this. Why did Joseph have to go to prison? Why did he? Because it's part of his story. It's part of his story for life. And God was writing a Bible. Do you realize that every Jewish person after, the life, after Joseph in the days of Moses, that every one of them, and all the Christians that you ever knew that have Bibles and went to, and Christians that don't even have Bibles and never been, they've heard the story of a guy named Joseph. And they all know that he went to prison unfairly, but he came out to a palace and he looks like Jesus Christ. And Paul said this in 2 Corinthians, for as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle, that's the book or the writing or the essay of Christ ministered by us, look at this, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. What does that mean? That means that you are the writing of God on this earth to the people around you. We sang that song, could we with ink the ocean fill, right? And were the sky a parchment made to write the love of God above, it couldn't hold it all, right? You know what the Lord does with his saints? He writes in your life something that he wants people to see. And that's what he did with Joseph. And you're going through things now. And some have been through these things. Remember, it may be painful. It may be agonizing. It's very personal. But it will reveal something on the inside of you that God put there. We'll see in the next message, the change that God made in Joseph is, is inside, in internal. All his life, He's been focused on what he would do for God. And I had a dream. And I was chosen. And I won't sin against God. But when he gets out of prison, he never says I again. He says, it's not in me. God will do it. Why? Because you see, the hope of the saint, what God wants to make of you is this. It's Christ in you that's the hope of glory it is not you and what you have so your life is a, we say all, or most of the time we say this your life's an open book you ever heard that what does that mean that means that the things in your life that happen to you and are known by people that's how they view you they view you how life happened to you why does God do it that way? Because that's what makes it personal. Close with this small thing. I can't explain it all, but I know the type. Do you know why the lamb was put on the fire? Well, we say we know the spiritual lesson because the agony, right, and the judgment on sin, right? But what happened to the lamb on the fire is also miraculous because the Bible says that the priests and in their home when they celebrated the Passover, when the blood was on the door and the lamb was on the fire, something happened that could include every person in the family. What was it? Well, the meat from the lamb could be eaten. It could be personalized. You see, when they shed the blood to put it on the door, well, it was a sacrifice, blood for atonement. When they put it on the fire, it was suffering for their sake. But now, because it's done that, every person, man, woman in the home, child, could take the lamb and the meat and the protein there could give you life. Do you know why you suffer? 
Because God, in a mysterious way, takes what happens to you, and he puts you through that, and somehow you become something that God can use personally in a way you weren't usable before. And you do something, and I do something that is astounding. We can sit and tell someone else our testimony, like Paul did, and say, you know, I found Christ as my Savior. And I prayed and repented of my sins and received Christ. And if you do it for me, he'll do it for you. And you know what happens? Sometimes people say, I want Christ. How can that happen? It's because through this miraculous way the Lord does it, through the prison, he makes you a walking, living testimony of Jesus Christ himself. Now, you don't think you are. And as we'll see later, you may still have faults. But do you know what Pharaoh saw in Joseph? He didn't say, here's this Hebrew kid. He didn't say, here's a kid that could read and write Hebrew and, and Egyptian. He didn't say, here's the rapist. He didn't say any of those things. He looked at his people, and he says in the next chapter, can we find a man like this? in whom is the Spirit of God. How did that happen to Joseph? Well, it happened at a prison. Many songs have been written from the prisons of people's lives. The one I remember the most, it's, it's an old song now, but in my life it was new. Bart Millard, he's from Texas. My family's from Texas, and now you know what's wrong with me, right? <laughs> Bart Miller's mother died of cancer when he was in high school. He had a career as a football player, and he was going to go into college, and he thought he would make it. He had scholarship offers on the table, and his senior year of football in high school down there, he got tackled the wrong way and broke out his knee and he never could play football again. His dream was shattered. His father was an alcoholic. He couldn't go to college. He had to stay home while everyone else went and work and try to support his father and come home and do all of these things. And you know what he did in the midst of all of that? In the midst of all that prison time, he wrote the words of a song I can only imagine. You sing it, don't you? I can only imagine. And he wrote it, and it has become what he was known for. In fact, he's known for it so much that the people who bought the rights to his song and were going to perform it before a huge crowd called him to sing it first. Because it's his, it's his song, see? It's him. It's the writing of God in him. Now, if you're in your prison right now, think about that. Because God's going to give you something there that he gives no one else. And he'll use it to his glory in this world like he uses no one else. Because everything with God and you is personal. Would you bow your heads? Just bow your heads.